want to sue them, right now it's actually the, one of the only choices is to fly into a place called Patriot Hills and then you from there jo go out to a special camp um, and then visit the Emperor Penguin Colony. We hope and plan that for actually the 13-14 Antarctic season that a ship by the name of the Captain Klebnikov will be back in action and that ship is an icebreaker with helicopters on board and that's how you can access the colony. So Emperor Penguins are something that a uh, little bit different. The only other possible option is that you might be able to get to see them in the Weddell Sea, but that would be right at the end of their uh, breeding season. If you've seen much of the penguins, you probably have seen some of the, or know some of the story and as much that uh, the females go ashore at the end of the Antarctic summer, lay their egg, give it to the male, the male over winters on the sea ice, and that sea ice grows, and you'll see in a map in a few minutes' time how much it grows. The male then hatches the chick, the female will possibly trek 40, 50, 60, maybe even 100 kilometres from the coast to take over from the, the male, and they quickly rush back to uh, the sea to, to basically feed before they starve to death. Um, so very different cycle. They're the only penguin that breeds on snow, permanent uh, snow and ice, or sea ice in the case of most emperors. So they're a bit different. The only other chance for most of our voyages would be perhaps in the Weddell Sea, which I'll cover towards the end of this presentation. So that's Emperor. It's a little bit different. I just wanted to be clear that the harder to see, harder to find. So one of the questions I think sometimes people have is, you know, what are the different seasons? When's the best time to go? And often I turn that back to you guys. It's like, what do you want to see? And I hope to answer some of the questions as to what you can see and when on a trip to Antarctica. Roughly, the season unfolds in, in, in many ways in, in the following context, in as much, obviously, you've got all of the birds or penguins and, and wildlife arriving back into Antarctica, and particularly the peninsula, which is where most of our voyages go to, and I'll touch on that in a little bit more uh, in a moment. But the courting, the whole ritual, so early in the season, which is really November, there's a lot of uh, frantic activity, whether it be albatross reconnecting with their partner, which is often a lifelong partner, or with the penguins, they're uh, meeting up with their mates to be again, so there's a lot of activity in, in courtship. Um, next bit, obviously following the courting, yes, the, the necessary bit that follows on is, is the mating, so that again will be really in November, maybe the first week of December. Then as the season progresses, it's a, probably a quieter time. So now we're probably into mid-December and through to the last weeks of December, they're sitting on their eggs. Slightly quieter with the, really the comings and goings of the males and females just to swap over. You'll also find that any time you go either through December and into January, at the top of the hill, you've got either eggs that are laid sooner or chicks that hatch earlier because, as I said before, other than emperors, all the other penguin species actually need to nest uh, on land clear of snow and ice. So at the top of the hill, the snow and ice clears first, so that's where you get the most adult chicks. Yeah, actually, as you go down the hill, the, the, the birds will get younger. I hope that makes some sense. So now we're really into the yeah, middle of December, and then towards the middle end of December into January, really gets very active again with uh, both parents heading off to sea in, um, in batches to uh, to feed and then bring back that food to their young. It's actually a fair bit of work going on right now to research the effect of the big krill fisheries down south because a lot of the penguin species, particularly emperors and gentoos, um, their main food source is krill. And if you take the macaroni penguin, there are believed to be 11 million of them. So if we change the, some of those food stocks, we could actually see quite a, a big crash in penguin numbers if we're not careful. But uh, Getting back to when to go in the season, so towards the end of January, February, as the chicks are getting bigger, and then really towards the end of February into March, you'll find that the chicks are actually bigger than their parents, a lot of antics and things going on. Occasionally our guides might have a bit of a joke, and um, I'll, I'll take the risk, and I won't know if you find it funny or not, I guess, but uh, I was with one guide once, he was our ornithologist guide, and uh, happened to be an American client, said to the guide, is that a different species of penguin? Because you'll find that a lot of the penguins, as they're growing older, um, they just end up with this little notch of, or top notch of uh, down that hasn't cleared on the top of the head. And the person said, is that a different species of penguin? And the guy goes, yes, that's actually a top notch penguin. It's not, there isn't such a thing, but uh, 
So towards the end of February and then into March, that's when things are going to peak and that's when you'll see a lot of activity in the young birds going into the water. So it really is, what do you want? Do you want to see the courting? Uh, do you want to see a calmer stage or do you want to see the activity of the young birds, particularly that applies to all the penguin species? Where do we go from? For most of our voyages, we head from the southern tip of uh, Latin America, from a place called Ushuaia. That's the shortest crossing to the Antarctic continent. And you can see on the picture there that, so you've got the maximum sea ice, which the continent itself is almost doubled in size. And even right at the end of February, most of the rest of the continent is still uh, either surrounded by permanent sea ice or very difficult to access. So there's two reasons why we go to uh, from Ushuaia is most of the wildlife is found on that Antarctic Peninsula. Certainly most of the penguin species, a lot of the seals, all those sorts of things, and very, very good for uh, whales, is going to accumulate along that uh, the, the peninsula, which is on, on the left of your screen. You can even see at the end of summer, it's still, or end of winter rather, it's still slightly open to uh, the sea. So that's where we head, and it's also a big benefit, is it's only about a day and a half, two days crossing from Ushuaia down to uh, the continent itself. Whereas if you go from Australia or Hobart, it could be four or five days before you get to the continent. That's our gateway to most of our voyages, this place called Ushuaia, at the very southern end of the Andes. Again, just a recommendation, however you travel there, and I think that's one of the things that I enjoy the most, is just encouraging people, just go, it is so magical but always get there the day before your voyage departs. You don't want to be stuck in Buenos Aires because the weather is closed in over the Andes and you can't get into Ushuaia. It would be a very sad and annoying and many other things beside that to arrive into Ushuaia to see your vessel disappearing down the Beagle Channel. Another question that people regularly ask is, you know, what's the Drake Passage really like? Uh, and it can be anything. Here's one example, they call it the Drake Lake, and you can see it's nice and calm as we're heading down the Beagle Channel. But it can be, another expression is the Drake Shake. So really it could happen any time of the year. You're no better off going in November or January as to the likelihood of, uh, I guess, avoiding heavy seas. It just depends if there's a cyclone coming through or a big weather system. Uh, you're going to get big, big seas. But again, we've got the right vessels, the right crew and the right captains to ensure whatever the weather conditions, you're going to be safe. So that hopefully that's set a little bit of the scene of the seasons. As I said, I often turn back the question to people is, what do you want to see? And they're the questions I suggest you send through to one of my co colleagues, Fiona, who's just to the left of me here in the office. So if you've got the questions, type them in and she'll ask them or we'll, I say we'll either save them up to the end. So if you've got any other questions I haven't answered, just sing out, let's get them answered. The Falklands, I think it's massively underrated as a wildlife destination. Um, a lot of people overlook it, certainly for Antarctica and um, the biggie in some ways would be South Georgia, but particularly if you're into your bird lice, but again, I think there's five species of penguins there. It's a lovely, lovely setting. I think a, a, an underestimated destination. Okay, gateway is going to be Port Stanley. Um, again, you've got the, the history there of, 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 of the locals call it the conflict. I'm a POM myself, but uh, I do find, I guess maybe it's any population that's been isolated for a long, long time, they're a bit different. But, um, and interestingly enough, that's the conflict, as they call it, actually started on the island of South Georgia, not in the Falklands. So you can have a look at that, but the wildlife is a big part of any trip to the Falkland Islands. But again, there's some old wrecks there, some fantastic photography, some nice trekking. All of these things will be part of a visit. And as with all of our voyages, really we try to give the, you the choice. We'll offer a number of different opportunities on any voyage. So you can one day go with a photographic group, another day go with a, a, perhaps a, someone, a group photo, focused more on uh, bird life. You can mix it up every day. I'm going to touch on a few things here, and people say, well, we've got a picture of a duck in a presentation for it. Particularly on the Falklands, there are a number of species endemic to the Falkland Islands, and this happens to be one of them. It's a Falklands flightless steamer duck, and as I said, there are a number of uh, um, bird species of that ilk. So if you're an ornithologist, people where I work think I'm slightly weird, and as much as I do know the names of my birds and things like that, I just have a, a a great interest in wildlife. I have a great interest in, in the flora as well. I just enjoy, like, I like to know what I'm looking at and just enjoy it that much more. And I'll touch on it now and I'll touch on it later is that one of the massive or just benefits and I guess it gives me the, um, 
the confidence and the belief in, to do my job is uh, I've actually just caught up with many of our expedition staff who've headed south um, for this season and they are just so excited about ha heading back to somewhere that they love, that they know an awful lot about and for me it just gives me an awful lot of confidence that I know that our clients are going to go and join some people who are incredibly passionate, really looking forward to heading back and spending time and introducing you guys to their favourite destination. So, like I said, they're almost like uh, kids at Christmas, they're going back to uh, a place they love. Other wildlife down here is something like this, it's called the Cobbs Wren, again endemic to the Falkland Islands. Um, it's a bit like the, the, the Galapagos Islands, if you're fortunate enough, fortunate enough to go there, the wildlife isn't frightened of you. There are regulations which obviously we will tell you all about and we don't want to frighten any of the wildlife or get too close to it. But as you'll see some of the images during the presentation, they don't know that and as long as you're still on quiet, it's amazing how close the wildlife will actually you know, come to you. There are two species of caracara. This one's called a, um, a, a striated caracara and another nickname is a Johnny Rook, but uh, they're in the Falklands. Um, there are kelp geese, uh, there are about four or five species of geese, they're ashy headed geese, um, rufous headed ducks, There's a, this is a long tailed meadow lark and on gorse they're again introduced by the English as they moved down there many many years ago. Turkey vultures, this one was actually threatening some night herons that had a nest nearby but so this is all just on a quick trip of the falcons, several species of gull, these are dolphin gulls, kelp gulls, and then into the skewers and the shags, and you can see the skewer here, he's really just trying to threaten the birds sitting on their nest to move a couple of inches to, to give up an egg, and it's, it happens with incredible frequency. And again, you can be, it's almost like the documentary will unfold in front of you, and we'll spend a number of hours ashore at different islands in the Falklands that all have different wildlife and different experiences. Um, different species of uh, snipe, this is the Magellanic snipe, uh, oyster catchers again, so, uh, sort of a subspecies of birds that we'll find here in Australia, and a biggie, and again probably the most popular and the most beautiful for me, uh, the uh, black braided albatross. It's a place called West Point Island in the Falklands where there's a, a decent sized colony, you can get again really nice and close, you can see these beautiful images of, of courting birds, and again through the season that would develop and later they'll be obviously sitting on their eggs. They nest on these little mounds which over many, many, you know, could be 20, 30 years of returning to the same nest site and the same mound and they build, build this tarp up, up out of the, the ground to keep away from uh, the snow which will fall during the season. A lot of rain and mud would be down the bottom of these but uh, that's how they keep their nest and their chicken egg away from that, that cold, horrible mess down below. Then they'll lay their eggs, um, beautiful, stunning birds. But I guess um, in flight is really where, where you see the beauty and they spend a lot of time preening. That's all from this one little colony called West Point Island. You can sit there and you're surrounded by these amazing birds. I'll touch on it here, something that I'm really quite proud of, that over the last 10 years, we've raised in excess of $600,000 for albatross conservation. In the last number of years, we've spent a lot of that, or given a lot of that money to a device that's being developed by the Australian Antarctic Division, a guy by the name of Dr. Graham Robertson. He's testing that now and we really do believe we've got a solution to long line fishing. Basically, either the albatross and some of the smaller petrels can dive quite a long way. They grab the, the, the baited hook from the long line fisheries, drag it to the surface, the albatross grabs hold of it, swallows it, and they get drowned. This new device, which he's developed, and we've, it's also Hewlett Packard Foundation have uh, put in some funds. It won an award recently from the World Wildlife Fund. This, this device is, is a practical solution and will stop um, bycatch and about say about a hundred thousand birds die needlessly every year. So when you see them and you you've witnessed how stunningly beautiful and graceful they are, and as I said, I think at the start they mate for life. And a lot we could learn from them, but uh, that's why I'm very proud that we've raised that money. So in and around the colony, as, as you can see how close we get there, there are some, again some barriers, so we don't get too close. But really, all you need is a reasonable camera with a fairly decent zoom lens and you will get some wonderful images. Some voyages, but just a few, I'm um, just going to mention this place called Steeple Jason, which is uh, part of the Jason Island group, which is to the north of the Falklands. There is a massive black browed albatross colony there of about 100,000 pairs, but very difficult place to land. A couple of years ago we did a special voyage which was slightly longer and we did manage to get ashore there. So 
we, we run them every now and again, but it's, say, it's a pretty tricky place to land, so we don't too often visit that, but uh, certainly a couple of years ago we got lucky. Still in the Falklands, rock upper penguins. Um, there's actually a small number of macaroni penguins there, but it's mainly these slightly strange looking rock hoppers that we'll find. And Magellanic penguins, these are also found on the Latin America homeland or mainland, and Gentoos. I don't cover them here, but uh, very small populations of king penguins here as well on the Falklands, but really quite small numbers, maybe 8, 10, 12 in, in two or three different colonies. But where we're going to head next is where we hope to see lots of uh, king penguins. But that's Falklands, I reckon just a stunning destination, really adds some good value and some different bird species um, on, on any voyage. You can see one of the um, picture there in the background, one of the ships that we use. We run a number of different uh, vessels. Um, so again, it depends really what you would like and what facilities and, and those sort of things as to which vessel we'd recommend. So again, after the presentation, uh, I'll see our website and we've got brochures and all those sorts of things. And we've got a team of people who can answer and have been to Antarctica that if you've got more specific questions and want to take it a bit further and uh, actually go there, then uh, you can follow that up with us and we'll send you all that information. So we're going to say goodbye to the Falklands. So they're quite different to South Georgia, very different to the Antarctic Peninsula. As you can, you know, sometimes sunny, beautiful beaches. It's almost like being somewhere in Australia, but uh, a beautiful destination all the same. My favourite, um, not going to make any bones about it, South Georgia. Uh, how I got into travel oh, too long ago now. I actually went on a safari to Africa. Um, I can even solve your finance problems. I, I, it would be an expensive car, but I actually got a bank loan to buy a car. I didn't buy a car, I went to Africa. So I think it was a wise decision, a good investment. And about a year later, I ended up working in Africa for over th three years, and that's where my wildlife uh, passion grew and developed. And I liken South Georgia almost to the Serengeti. It is just this big, powerful, wonderful place. So let's go and have a look around South Georgia. I think we've got a question here, so I'll let Fiona come in with that. I just have a question from Lisa, who is wondering how life, how close can you get to the wildlife in the Falklands and South Georgia as well as in the Antarctic Peninsula? Cool. Good question. And uh, really, you'll see a couple of images coming up here as to actually how close the wildlife gets to us. But many places, we actually, uh, so we work with the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators and, and they've, we've worked with them over the years to develop some guidelines to ensure that the wildlife isn't threatened. You can actually usually tell if you're too close, it starts to move away or it behaves differently. It's really, to me, it's quite obvious when you've got too close. So there are some minimum distances which we will educate everyone and we do enforce because we want to be able to go back to these places. We want to look after them. But I think I mentioned it before, one of the good things is if you keep nice and still, if you lie down quite often or make yourself small and you're not the horizon, much of the wildlife will actually come very close to you. Um, there's a few beasties we'll see in a few moments, like the Antarctic fur seals, that you actually don't want getting too close to you. You need to move away pretty quickly if they, they get too close. But uh, So there are some minimum distances, but a lot of the wildlife, like in the Galapagos, could be just uh, two or three metres away. Um, and again, it, like I said, you keep still and quiet, they come even closer. Sometimes they'll even come and peck your boot and uh, get really close. You'll see, you saw from the previous image in many ways, you can see here it's early in the season, a lot of snow around. And later in the year, you can see that from the image before, it was very, very green. So early season, so November, much more snow, perhaps a bit more difficult and underfoot, but a very beautiful place. Later in the season, a lot of that snow, certainly at lower altitudes, will have disappeared. The beauty about the Falklands is it's this tiny place, this little speck in the Southern Ocean, but some of the mountains there are over 3,000 metres high. It really just rears out of the Southern Ocean in, from, from nowhere. Um, and is stunningly visually beautiful. It's got some great history. You've got uh, Gritviken um, here, which is where Shackleton actually is buried. It's, he was moored in the harbour here and had a heart attack and died. And I can think of no better place for, almost for Shackleton, to, Shackleton to be buried. Amazing story. And whilst I'm focusing on the wildlife here, um, we will spend time talking about Shackleton and Scott and all Mawson and um, Hurley and a whole lot of other great explorers as part of our voyages. Often on the days when you're sailing from one place to another, we'll run a number of presentations, again, optional that you attend, but certainly you'll gain an awful lot of uh, knowledge and insight from our um, onboard experts. 
So group fitting is something we'll spend a bit of time and there's some great walks just out of here. And again, we offer you know, probably three or four or five different walks just out of this one place. Some quite extended, some shorter. So depending on really your interest, um, sometimes your ability, but mostly your interest uh, as to what you want to do. So a quick look around South Georgia, Antarctic fur seals. Um, the presentation I did uh, on Saturday, I still had my mo, mo from November, so I likened it to this dude here who's got a very fine set of whiskers. I'm pleased that I don't have it today. Uh, hopefully that's better for you guys as well. But uh, the Antarctic fur seals, almost hunted to extinction, uh, but have recovered very, very well. Um, occasionally this is where a monopod for a camera comes in handy, but because they can be a little bit pushy, so just Word of caution, again, listen to your guides. Um, we don't want to get into conflict with these dudes. They've, uh, they can be a little bit aggressive, particularly when you're there early in the season because that's part of their whole courting, their mating, they're guarding their, their group, their harem of females. So yeah, you've got to remember you're in their space. Let's make sure we uh, don't get too close sometimes. With the wildlife itself, often it's barking and you can see these guys have gone alongside each other. They're trying to avoid contact, they're trying to size each other up. They don't really want to get into a big fight. They use a lot of energy and some of the fights can be really quite uh, uh, brutal. But if you want to see that sort of thing, and not, not from, a, I guess, the brutal side of it, just from a, it's part of wildlife, it's nature, you really need to go early in the season. So go in November. Um, there's a lot of wide open mouths on South Georgia at that time of time, so elephant seals. That's again, they're saying, he's making this incredible deep belly guttural roar, which is, I said to a few people a number of years ago, I really wanted to, to tape it and use it as my mobile phone, because I reckon that'd be a great thing to have that ringing in your pocket with this really quite different sound. It sounds like really bad plumbing. If the, I'm not sure if the tongue poking or the wide open mouths and the, the sands don't work, then you'll find the elephant seals, that's when they'll get into combat. So you've got these massive, they call them beach masters, they're guarding an area of the beach with their females. Um, again, you've got to go early November, get on one of those first voyages to the Falklands, South Georgia and Antarctica. It's an 18 night voyage and you'll get to see this in action uh, around you. So it really is quite spectacular. The females, as with many ladies around the world, are far more serene, a bit more calm, not so much into uh, the bluster of uh, fighting and the like, but even they, sometimes they'll uh, resort to telling here's a, an Antarctic skewer to, to nick off, but you can see some of the big males, or the big male laid right, right in front of her there. A couple of other things I'm going to touch on that are a bit different. You, you perhaps wouldn't win too many uh, beauty stakes, these giant petrels. But uh, this is around a kill, and they're, they're feeding uh, from a seal carcass. Um, but really, some just making some incredible shapes with their bodies. If we're around a nesting colony of these, we need to be very, very careful. Really, very shy birds, easily disturbs, and uh, the distances we actually get to those to answer sort of more specifically Lisa's question from before really was that uh, I think it's a minimum of 20 meters will keep away from these birds when they're at their nesting colony. So, beautiful birds, a bit different. Uh, I guess you can almost liken them to the hyenas of uh, the Serengeti that I mentioned before. I've got a soft spot for hyenas as well, and I think these birds are, are amazing beasties as well. But a lot of it, it's all about you guys sitting down, enjoying, taking in the scenery, taking in that wildlife. And again, we, what we try to do is maximize our time ashore. The vessels, they vary a little, but they're all comfortable. The food is fantastic. Probably you'll put on weight, which a lot of people don't expect. But uh, the food is very, very good. But really, a lot of the emphasis of all of our voyages is getting you out there, either in a zodiac or ashore, where we can make our, our own discoveries often time. Moving on to the king penguins. Sometimes just one or two, sometimes tens of thousands of them. So there are about four big sites. Um, Salisbury Plain, St. Andrews Bay, Gold Harbour, um, uh, three of the four big ones where there are some massive colonies. I guess I'll touch on it here that um, please, if you head to Antarctica, be flexible in, in your mind and your attitude because the weather changes daily. It's a bit like here in Melbourne that, uh, was it three seasons in a day or whatever it is, sometimes here's like four, can happen really quickly in Antarctica. If the waves get up, if the winds get up, it may not be possible to go ashore at the sites that we've earlier selected. But the wonderful thing about here and or the peninsula is there are many, many sites that we can have a look at and uh, given good time, we will uh, we'll still be able to get you ashore one place or another, but be flexible and understand that we may change things as we go through. 
The interesting thing, and a very different thing to the emperors that we saw right at the start, is that uh, because of the whole breeding cycle, if you go to um, any of the king penguin colonies, there'll be young chicks. You can see the brown fluffy things here. Uh, there'll be adults with eggs. There'll be adult courting. So it's almost a, a year-round cycle. Uh, certainly when we're traveling there, there's all different types of activity. Uh, so that's part of the beauty. And sometimes if you just sit down in the middle of that and just let the whole thing wash over you, that's a great way to experience it. So we'll see them coming ashore, we'll see them trumpeting, uh, they're part of their courtship, uh, just preening. And this is all, uh, many of these images are just taken on one voyage, so I mean, I've, I've tried to keep it at that in as much that uh, um, the weather sometimes is good and the weather sometimes not so good, but uh, that's the way it can be. You can see these massive mountains, so it's an incredibly powerful setting that you find the king penguins. So they're all there and you're in amongst that and this is again all on South Georgia. It's amazing that uh, quite a different, you saw the emperor chicks before, they're grey and I, I assume that must be because they spend their, their um, sub-adult life on ice um, and these guys are spending their, their juvenile um, months on rocky ground and things like that so probably that's why very similar species, obviously divided a number of thousands of years ago but uh, quite different. Maybe that answers the question about how close can you get. You can see is, here's uh, one of the, the shag species that you find down there. And you can see the uh, king penguins who've actually just come ashore. Uh, if we keep nice and still, they'll just wander in and around and look at us and have some, st it's almost they look at us in the same way that we look at them and they say, what are you doing here? Some of the other birds you might find around, snowy sheath bills. Uh, they're like the, almost the chickens of uh, Antarctica in some ways. Well, these are beautiful creatures, the macaroni penguins, a much broader bill. And as I mentioned, I think earlier that uh, up to, uh, they believe, about 11 million. So this is one of the most popular species of penguin. Beautiful Antarctic terns. And the amazing thing is that we also run voyages to the Arctic. Um, and you can be in the Arctic in July, and then you can be down in Antarctica in November, and the same birds will be with you. So Arctic terns spend their northern hemisphere winter down in Antarctica. So you can see them in, Antar in the Arctic in July and you can see them again in November after a 17,000 kilometer migration trip. There's also Antarctic terns who will nest and spend their summer down south. So we'll have a look at those too. And they're really quite noisy, can be really quite aggressive uh, for a tiny little bird. They certainly punch above their weight, but very beautiful. Quickly touch on a couple of other endemics that you find in South Georgia, so you'll certainly have a number of birders, and one of the things that uh, so I'm interested in my birds, as I said to start with, um, ornithologists who join us on birds, some of them would certainly fall into the group that are called, um, they're labelled, which I don't particularly like in some ways, the term twitchers, they know how many species they've seen, whether it be 3,000 or 5,000 or 6,000. This is one of the reasons some of those people will go to South Georgia, these are endemic to the, the island, this is South Georgia pintail. So very beautiful little ducks, but uh, just to be found on South Georgia. And the only uh, songbird found on South Georgia is something called a South Georgia pipit, massively affected by uh, influx of rats that were brought by the, by the whalers. So a lot of their nesting sites have been destroyed, but there are still a few islands where you can find some of the pipits. With the other big highlight, really, that I, I think anyone, well, for me, uh, uh, I'll just keep it to me then, you make your own choices as to what the highlights are for places, but you've got your king penguins, stunningly beautiful, big numbers, and then you've got these just stunningly beautiful wandering albatross. So again, if you get there early in the season, you may well see them during their amazing courtship displays. Uh, later in the year, you've got to be a little bit lucky because again, they will leave their chicks for, for weeks at a time, and you need a nice windy day because again, for albatross, basically, they can't flap their wings effectively. It, they fly using the wind. If it's a calm day, they won't be flying. Uh, but you want almost a windy day when you go ashore onto the islands and hopefully one of the, the, the adults is coming in to, to feed some of the chicks. And some of the other species, there are so many different species of prions, of petrels. You've got these tiny little storm petrels, which will be dancing on the top of the water. And you've got these other albatross species here, the uh, light-mantled sooty. They're all around you. They're with you on any voyage. And again, you might be out amongst it in a zodiac, and this is right at the southern end of uh, South Georgia. We will again, as I said, look at some of the, the old wrecks and different things like that, and some of the boats will be particularly focusing on photography and enjoying that. We're heading off to the Antarctic Peninsula, so whether you head straight out of South Georgia, south to the peninsula, or you do the Falklands in South Georgia first, um, the wild or the bird life is with you all the time. So whether it be these things called uh, cape petrels or what local name is pintado, they're around following the back of the ship. 
the Wandering or even the Royal Albatross or all the way over from New Zealand, some of the other sub-Antarctic islands, that's with you all the time. black bay Albatross, they'll be with you and flying around the vessel. Um, they're attracted to it because sometimes they're attracted to some of the shipping vessels, which is, as I touched on a long line fishing before, a bit of a problem in itself, but uh, they will be circling our vessel all the time. Often with whales, you will see the blow, and you won't see that much more. You might see one of the fins on the back, or uh, if they're diving and feeding, the, the tail fin and the fluke. But uh, the guides on board, you'll have some specialists, say ornithologists, but you'll also have a cetacean expert who will be able to tell you. He'll be able to tell you from the angle, the height, and uh, the frequency of the blow, which species of whale that you're looking at. Um, a couple of years ago when we were crossing the Antarctic Convergence, which is where the cold Antarctic waters mix with the uh, warmer waters from south, we actually crossed that and there were 19 blue whales. So again, changes by, by voyage, by season as to what you can see and a lot of it is luck. As soon as we see these, these snow petrels, you know you're getting close to some ice and you're getting close to the continent itself. And one of the big celebrations will be our first iceberg and then we'll get down to the peninsula itself. I want to make it, try and make it very clear here that on the peninsula, really there are three species of penguins that you're going to see. There's actually, I think, yeah, there's two in this image. You can see there's one Gentoo who's mainly black with a white stripe on his head, and the others are very obvious, and their name is Chinstrap, so that's a really good name. And the third species that you'll find down there are Delis. So any trip to the peninsula, yeah, we're going to be having a look for the whales. Often we'll, we'll see them just as they're, they're cresting to dive, to go down to feed. Later in the season, it tends to happen. So again, later into February and March, but please don't, you know, it's not a guarantee, but I, th I think it makes sense, common sense, that the birds, are, the whales, when they go early, they're hungry, they're feeding. They're feeding in the rich water, so they're busy with that. Later in the season, they're nice and full, and they tend to spend more time looking around and playing, and this is a, a whale spy hopping here. Everyone's meant to be sat down in the zodiac, so we've lost total control, but... Uh, in some way, we do have control, but uh, it's an exciting and a memorable experience. And again, so a bit later in the season, you might well see this, with particularly the humpbacks who come and say hi. Often we'll see the tail flukes. And hopefully we'll see some orcas. But again, like any wildlife, wild experience, it varies by voyage. And, but the more time you spend on, top, on, on deck, the more time you spend looking at, the more time you're going to see. Um, this was on a, a recent voyage when there was a group of, uh, we believe, up to 50 orcas in one significant pod. And they came right beside the edge of the vessel. How close do some of the whales get? Well, you can see there's a very nice fashionable bubble hat there that uh, keeps your noggin warm, but uh, the orca's very, very close by. Um, Move on to some of the other wildlife, the seals. There are three main species of seals, so these wet hill seals, stunningly beautiful. This is a young pup. You can see it's a different colour to his mum behind there. But they, they sing. They make this incredibly beautiful sound. So again, if you're lucky and you get close to them, you'll just hear them. It's a bit like the belugas up in the Arctic who are called the canaries of the sea. These uh, seals have a beautiful, beautiful vocalisation. So you've got mainly you've got Weddell seals and then you've got Crabbiter seals. And I think fairly recently they worked out that after humans, this, this is the most populous mammal on the planet. There are millions and millions of them. So they've got slightly longer snouts, a bit more brown generally in colour, but again, we'll often see them laid out onto the ice flows and we'll get nice and close to them in our zodiacs. And again, that's where we ask everyone, be nice and quiet, don't move around too quickly. Again, if you're standing up, you're breaking the horizon, we don't want to frighten them. And the other biggie we see down south are going to be leopard seals. You can see you've really got this prehensile head. Um, yeah, they're one of the top predators down south and tend to see them a lot more at the end of the season, purely because when the penguins are learning to swim, these guys, uh, it's a time for easy kills for them. Um, but a stunningly beautiful animal all the same. But a lot of time we'll see them just hauled out, relaxing on the ice flows as we cruise past in the zodiacs. Penguins can't fly, can they? Well, there you go, he's having a go at it. I mean, they fly underwater, and, uh, and they're also very, very graceful, as you can see. He's mistimed his entry a little bit there. I don't know you get too many marks out of 10, but uh, these are the Adelie penguins, uh, one of the species I mentioned before. This is Gentoo, and these are the chin traps. You find, again, early in the season, you have a lot of this running around with uh, stones to build, build their nests. This was a few seasons ago when incredibly heavy snow. These birds wouldn't have been su successful as breeding because this ground should be clear of snow and ice. And they take their stones to the top of the hill and they walk a long way to do it. And probably one of the other penguins nearby will just walk over and nick the stone. So I think the smart ones, they just wait around and nick the other guy's stones. And then they celebrate with part of their whole courtship. 
for some of the places we'll visit, we'll just have this stunning scenery. It's part that you'll be you'll be in and amongst it, and in amongst the wildlife, in and amongst the colonies. And again, I mentioned before that on the left there's a gentoo, and so you do get colonies of mixed birds together. We will go ashore in all sorts of weather, and the weather can change whilst we're ashore. And you can see here how tough the little birds are. They'll just uh, head down and keep nice and warm. And uh, as I said to start with, um, no such thing as bad weather, just inappropriate clothing. And you'll see some of the, the guides here. You know, got some keen photographers on board. They're all wrapped up nice and warm. And again, it makes them just for some magical photography. So again, we do some tri uh, trips ashore by Zodiac. Sometimes we just cruise in the Zodiacs and sometimes we cruise around just in the ship. We'll enjoy all of the massive ice, uh, the incredible scenery, the destination, as well as the wildlife. Some people, up to a maximum of 16, can get, head off and do a little bit of kayaking, which is just a beautiful way to explore. And even in Zodiac, sometimes the weather comes down. I've got a slightly strange sense of humour in some ways. I love when it's like this. It uh, makes it even more magical. We might be, get a bit cold, you might get a little bit wet, but you've got the right clothing, and that's all something that we can help you to make sure you're well prepared for when you get there. But soon you'll be back on, on board with a nice hot cup of hot chocolate or sometimes, well, whiskey if you want it, whatever you want, and uh, these are just memories you'll treasure forever. The weather, as I said, it just varies day by day. It depends. Sometimes you have a beautiful blue sky, sometimes here a bit more moody and grey, but uh, I use the next two images. So here's the La Mer Channel, which will get up really early this day, probably maybe 5 a.m. and cruise through before the winds pick up. The winds pick up during the day and then they make the water uh, less calm and less smooth. And you see this beautiful reflection, so we'll get up nice and early. And uh, so really whether it's beautiful blue sky like that or grey and overcast like that, I think they're both stunningly beautiful. So it's just it's what you get and uh, luck comes with it. So stunningly beautiful scenery and uh, we'll enjoy that as part of any of our voyages as well as you know, a fairly significant focus on the wildlife. So we're heading towards the end of the presentation now. As I said, you can head off and do a bit of kayaking, which is a beautiful way to uh, just be quiet and still and away from uh, and be under your own steam, I guess, a different view of it altogether. Quickly onto the Weddell Sea, so onto the eastern side of the peninsula. It really opens up at the end of the Antarctic season, so you can't go there until uh, February or March, massive tabular icebergs. This is where the uh, emperor penguins would have been breeding on sea ice in this area. This would have all been covered with permanent thick sea ice, but it's all broken up and melted at this stage. And uh, it may be that that's an emperor underwater. It could be if you go there in March, you might still, or February, March, you might find them, but often it could be the glimpse you get is actually underwater, which is obviously their true environment. One of the big highlights, uh, uh, this is all where Shackleton and the endurance got stuck and smashed to pieces and that's where that whole adventure started. So that's part of the journey we'll take there. But also one of the big goals is going to see a, a colony of these Adeli penguins where there are just tens of thousands and they're all up onto the hillside up behind. It's a place called Paulat Island. So again, that's a, one of the big highlights of the Weddell Sea as well as the history in these massive tabular icebergs. What's it all about? It's about introducing and uh, just having fun and enjoying a magical experience to, to Antarctica or as I said it could, could be the Arctic as well and uh, we just love enjoying and seeing the smiles uh, of our clients and really it's made up by just wonderful expert guides who love what they do. I touched on this before but uh, many of them have, will have been there 10 years in a row and I said the guy I met the other day Woody has been working with us for many many years now he used to work here in the office with me and uh, he's now, his career is down there and he's just he's like a kid. He's so looking forward to heading south for another season and, and introducing his favourite place to uh, lots of, uh, well, I guess, many that become friends to him. So our guides make a big difference. The vessels, the voyage that you choose, they're all the big things to have a good look at in questioning which trip you have uh, to go on. So I'm going to sort of finish off the presentation here. Now there's a little bit of... Uh, some beautiful footage and some wildlife just to finish off and then at the end of that or in fact we've got another question quickly now I'll take that uh, so Emma asks <coughs> Emma asks uh, why would you travel to Antarctica over the Arctic good question um, whew, uh, most people from Australia tend to go to Antarctica first possibly because of the history that it's well, it's not really closer, but uh, that's what we tend to find. It really would, like maybe the penguins, it's different species of wildlife. No penguins in the Arctic, um, polar bears in the Arctic, 
walrus in the Arctic, so if it's a wildlife thing, it's, sometimes it's the choice of that, but we find that most people go to Antarctica first from here, uh, possibly the historical connection, we've got I mean, a lot of bases down there and a lot of interest in Antarctica and a lot of our, you know, um, whether it be Hurley and all those people, Australians with a long involvement in Antarctica. Um, so really the question is, both have incredible ice scenery, massive icebergs, Obviously, Antarctica is bigger and is, is a land-based continent itself, but the Arctic, again, stunningly beautiful, wonderful uh, wildlife opportunities, uh, and obviously your biggie up, up north is, is the polar bear. And I'm touching wood here that uh, on all of our voyages today, we've seen some polar bear up in the Arctic, but I often turn that back to people. You write your list of the things that you want to see most, and that'll choose where you head off. And you've got another one? Yes, so Helen would like to ask... Um, she says, my son Dylan would like to know how far south you have travelled in Antarctica. How far south? I'd have to go and actually look up degrees, but uh, the furthest I've gone south myself is into the Weddell Sea. That was on an, an icebreaker called the Captain Klebnikov. What I'll do is I'll go and look up how the farthest point south we got on that, uh, on that voyage, and I'll email that to you later. But uh, that's the furthest I've got south. Um, yeah, quite a long way south. But um, because we had an icebreaker, we could actually push further into some into the Weddell Sea than, we, than we'd normally be able to. But uh, I'll answer that specifically offline because I can't remember exactly how far south we got. Okay, so please keep sending any questions if you've got any more. Um, just to, sort of to finish off, but uh, I'm happy, more than happy we'll be here to answer any more questions after the presentation. We've got another one already. That's good. Uh, so Ray would like to know. What is the best time of year to travel? Again, I, I turn that back to you, Ray. Work out what you want to see. If you want the, if you want the courting, that sort of activity of the penguins. If you want to go to South Georgia, you want to see those big beach masters, the elephant seals, uh, in their, you know, defending their harems. You've got to go in November. If you want more frantic activity of young chicks on the nests. Um, and the penguins and all that activity, then I'd go sort of middle of January into early February. Again, if whales are a big thing and you want to increase the chance of maybe seeing one of those wonderful humpbacks coming up, spy hopping next to the zodiac, again, I'd be pushing towards the end of the season. But uh, your choice. Uh, so Ray says that he would really like to see the orcas hunting. So what would oh. be the best time to see that? Um, Again, uh, that happens all year round. It was interesting. I went on a voyage um, several years ago now in January, February, and uh, we only glimpsed orcas at a distance. But equally, I know that of other voyages where someone, um, we were contacted by, by National Geographic for the Pros and Planet series that's just been on TV because one of our clients actually videoed one of the first times they'd, they'd seen the orcas creating the bow wave to wash the seals off of the ice flows which was, if you saw the series recently, but uh, that was, um, I wouldn't have been first witness, but certainly first captured on film on one of our vessels, uh, voyages, that was later in the season. That said, not, my most recent trip in November a year ago, uh, that big group of uh, 50 orcas was on a voyage that would have been right the first week of December. So they're there all year long. It really is, uh, a lot of it is chance. So the more time you can spend, which is, uh, you might say you're likely to say that as a, as a ship operator, a tour operator, but that longer voyage, you spend a fair bit of time at sea going from Falklands to South Georgia, South Georgia down to the peninsula. It increases your chances of seeing some of the whale species. Um, and then it's really, it's luck that will, you get the draw that you might be in a zodiac when they're in hunting seals on a little ice flow and, uh, that'll be something that uh, you'd be lucky to see and it's a magical probably once in a season experience that uh, a group gets to see but I don't think that you could say there's a time to see it. Um, so uh, Tim wants to know is the thought of global warming affecting Antarctica? Uh, it is and in fact in, in some strange different ways um, you saw the chin strap there in the, in the snow um, so what is happening in the peninsula is it's warming up, and it's actually warming up in, in contrast to historical terms quite quickly there, and that is causing more precipitation. So precipitation down there falls as snow, and that is causing problems. So that was I think, two or three seasons ago. Many 
many of the penguin species would have failed to breed effectively that year because the snow was around when they were laying their eggs and the, they would have all got too cold and wet. Uh, so absolutely, it's, it's, it's changing things. Um, some of the big ice shelves are slowly starting to, well, they're, they're definitely shrinking and some of them are, are breaking up. And this is a lot of, again, you can read a lot about it and there's a fair bit of conjecture as to really just how much is going to change it's similar in Greenland, you've got those incredible aquifers where the water flows under the ice cap and their biggest fear is that many of those will actually then lubricate the surface between the rock and the ice and then the, some of those ice caps could very quickly disappear off into the ocean. So yes, it's changing it. Um, oh, yeah, I guess, we wouldn't say too much more than that. It is changing things, but the wildlife is still amazing. Um, I just hope that we're smart enough, I guess, to, to do something about it before we get too drastic changes. Okay, well, we'll move on to the footage and so some, just some stunning wildlife images. Uh, again, all just taken on one voyage, so it's not sort of been cherry-picked from all the best of uh, a season or a, the last 10 years of travel. And then I still we'll be here and online if you've got any more questions. So I'm going to say thank you for joining us. Um, lots more to find out, so if you're really inter more interested and want to travel with us, just give us a call, send us an email, go to the website. Um, as I said right at the outset, I think the biggest thing for me is if you're thinking about it, just do it and then it's really your choice as to uh, who you travel with and which trip you do. So I'll say thank you for now and any more questions, just keep them coming in. Thanks. And 
Beautiful pictures of you, beautiful man. 